and we're live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another On.NET Live. My name is Cecil Philip, and today we're going to be learning about implementing clean architecture inside of our .NET applications with my friend here, Ian Cooper. So, Ian, before we get started, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone and let folks know who you are and what do you do? Hey, I'm Ian Cooper. I'm based out of London in the uh, UK, uh, where I am a uh, uh, job site officer. She's a principal engineer for Just Eat, Just Eat Takeaway. And I focus a lot on uh, kind of messaging uh, event space. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Just Eat in the UK is a, is a, is a .NET shop. Um, uh, and uh, I work on an open source project called Brighter, which we can talk about later tonight, which um, forms some of the role that says something like, a mediator performs basically, uh, but also actually acts to work with um, messaging as well. Um, uh, and the other thing I guess I'm known for is um, talking about test driven development, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> nice. And Ian, you mentioned that you're call calling in from the UK. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Florida, and I know we have tons of folks inside of the chat right now that are coming in from all over the world. So I want to make sure that we give everyone a moment really quickly. Um, as I'm looking over, I see we have some folks from South Africa, some folks from Norway, um, Turkey, the Ukraine. Um, let's see, like we have some folks from South America, from India. Here's someone from Colombia. So definitely shout out to everyone that's here. Really appreciate you all joining us again for another On.net Live. Here we go. Here he goes now. Here comes the, the, the floodgates. There's Algeria. There's, there's all kind of folks here. Brazil. Shout out to Brazil. Again, thank you for everyone that's here joining us. Again, we always want to make sure that we take a moment to just acknowledge all the folks and countries and everyone that's interested in learning about .NET. Now, before we jump, I'm sorry? Folks in the Ukraine are up late then. Yeah, I, that, that's what I'm thinking. We have someone here from Plantation, Florida. That's 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 interesting. Um, who else do we got? Yeah, we got folks from all over the place. Right? This is this is amazing. Someone here from Jordan. Um, so again, always definitely always appreciate folks whenever they, they join the show. Now, before we really start diving into clean architecture, as always, I want to share some links and share some of the announcements and highlights of things that have been going on. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. And here we go. So first thing I want to talk about, I, I know this has been like a big topic on social media lately. Everyone has been talking about it and sharing little clips and videos and stuff like that. But GitHub announced this thing called Copilot, which seems to be like, like so it's not autocomplete. But it is kind of autocomplete. It's not, you know, it's not um, IntelliSense, but it seems like it's it's literally like AI pair programming with you, which is really, really cool and interesting. So if you head over to copilot.github.com now, you could sign up for the preview. I think some folks have already gotten in. I haven't gotten in yet. I'm still trying to get in. Um, but again, this list definitely looks like something pretty cool. Ian, have you have you gotten into the preview? Have no, you tried it? I, I I signed up, uh, but I haven't yet. Actually, I'm not actually in, but uh, I I joined everybody else, so I wouldn't be left out. Um, you, mentioned, <laughs> you, you mentioned in code spaces earlier. I still haven't got into that, so uh, I'm I'm low down the list of whatever um, uh, handouts come. Yeah, I notice every time GitHub announces something, like the floodgates for getting into it, like code spaces for this for GitHub Actions. Like people just like, oh, let me, let me, you know, let me dive into it. So I'm hoping I get into this soon. Uh, maybe at some point in time, we could do a show to talk about like some of the technology behind Copilot if, if folks would be interested in, in that type of stuff. Uh, da -da 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 -da. All right, now moving on. So next blog post that I want to share with folks, this one is from Redbox. So Redbox is a company, if you're unfamiliar, they do movie rentals, but like, you know, actual physical disc rentals still. Um, but you know what I didn't know, like Redbox actually uses .NET, and they wrote a really interesting blog post about how they're moving over to GraphQL using the hot chocolate project that our friend um, Michael works on. And um, so, if you're interested in learning about like their story behind why they adopted GraphQL, like some of the tools they're using in addition to um, hot chocolate and some of these types of things, um, definitely check out this blog post. I'll make sure I share the link inside of the chat too. Um, so folks could take a look at it. Um, again, I, I know a little bit about GraphQL. I haven't deployed anything to production with it, but I don't, it feels like GraphQL is like, again, all the rage now for folks, just like we had like a bunch of folks talking about REST. Um, Ian, have you have you written, written anything in GraphQL or tried it out before? So uh, we've played with it a bit. Um, we, we haven't, a lot of our services are still 
um, classic API, JSON, Open API, JSON services. And we do do composition quite often. And we were wondering whether we might start trying to use it to provide effectively the kind of you know BFF layer um, by composing various um, classic Open API style uh, microservice interfaces. But yeah. that's still, we're still kind of on the edges of figuring out um, whether the techs kind of mature enough to, to do that yet. But some people are definitely playing in that space. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. And then, again, if there's any folks in the chat that if you're using GraphQL as well, again, let us know um, if, if you're interested in us having some more coverage about that on the show. And last link that I'm going to share before we start to dive into our topic today, um, .NET Conf focus event. So .NET Conf has a few events throughout the year, um, in addition to like the main conference that usually happens in November. And for this particular focus event, is going to be happening this month, July 29th, and it's going to be focused on F Sharp. Now, like this was just recently announced, like all of the speakers haven't been announced yet and all the sessions haven't been announced yet, but you could definitely come here, you could save the date and you could see some of the folks that, you know, you may or may not see like show up on the, on that day. So if you're interested in learning about F Sharp, seeing what people build with it and, you know, just some interesting use cases and projects, definitely make sure you head over to focus.net.net. Wow, that's <laughs> that's an interesting URL. And um, you know, make sure you check out the focus event. That's going to be on July 29th, 2020, 2021. All right. Now, that being said, my screen's going to come off. And Ian, this is your show now. So I'm going to have you dive into a little bit about this thing I keep hearing about, which is called clean architecture. Like I've been wondering. Like, what is it exactly? Like, what what are the components of clean architecture? What do I need to do to implement it? So I'm hoping you could help us a little bit with like answering some of these questions. Cool. All right. So let me share. Oh, yeah. And then whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and put up your screen. Let me just get the. And then we can start talking. It's up, it. rather than um, uh, well, otherwise we'll be staring into infinity. All right. Does that look good? Yep, that looks good. All right, let's get to it. All right. So uh, what, what I'll do, we'll do is, is I will get to clean architecture. But um, I find it's actually quite useful to start somewhere else. And that's to kind of assemble, understand the building blocks that build up towards where clean architecture is. So I want to talk about modules. Um, so forgive me if you remember all of your, you know, computer science you've done in the past and you know modules backwards, but let me just kind of level the playing field for everybody. And also I want to talk about it a bit because sometimes I feel in kind of the, in .NET land and it's in the Twitter sphere, some people are a bit down on modules and layers. So I wanted to kind of like, just talk about what they really are. So really this is, this diagram represents my kind of concept of uh, generically what a module is, right? So it's something where we say we have some kind of facade, which provides the functionality of the module. And it's generally sort of coarse grained. And then we have the implementation details, which provide the actual how the module works. And what we're trying to do with a module is say, rather than you having to know anything about the implementation details, you just have to know about the facade. And that principle is known as implementation hiding. And we can think about the fact that lots of things do uh, kind of have this characteristic of being a module, right? A class has the characteristics of being a module, right? We hide away the implementation details. We have a public kind of set of uh, members and uh, methods that effectively are narrower than the overall uh, implementation details of the class. And we, we put that idea of implementation hiding is kind of central to what object orientation is doing. So objects in a way are, are kind of modules. Generally, we, that when we talk about modules uh, as a design idea, we tend to be thinking about something slightly bigger normally than just a, just a module, just a, just a class. So the idea is that my module depends on another module. And what happens is my details, my implementation details, depend on another module's facade. It's basically the abstraction over the details it contains. And other modules might depend on my facade, right? So you get this model of details depend on a facade, effectively, uh, and the far facade itself depends on its own implementation details, right? So we can say a module's details should depend upon another module's abstraction or facade. 
but the abstraction of a module should not depend on another module's details, only its own details. Right? And we can slice the system up into a set of modules where each module represents some part of our functionality such that the people working on that individual module can say to everybody else, hey, you only need to really understand my facade. Provided you can understand that, you don't need to know the details. You can kind of focus on your module. You can focus on the things that, that you care about doing. And when you need to use the stuff I provide, you can just focus on the facade. And if you think about the way we use, for, say for example, the, the, the base class library in .NET Framework, we're essentially doing this, right? We're using all those classes. We don't really necessarily need to understand the implementation detail. Sure, we can kind of trace through nowadays in a debugger and kind of see what's going on. But actually, we, we don't need to, to do that, right? And this is just really saying we could actually do that at a slightly higher level, a level of a module, where we could have, say, objects that provide implementation details and objects that provide the facade. So we, we deal with a narrow number of objects and their internal details. And indeed, you know, if you if you drill far enough into an object, sometimes in the in the base class library, you'll find objects inside that essentially are not ones you deal with. Right. So that object right. outside actually has some some inside that you that you don't deal with. Um, so like, as you're talking about that, in my head, I just think about like dependency graphs, right? Yeah. Like my my application or my my code or my SDK or whatever the case is is dependent upon something that's on the outside. But like you're saying, what I, I should be dependent on the abstraction versus like the actual fine grains implementation of that right. abstraction. Right. Because you don't want to know about the details. You just let somebody else worry about the details. You just use the functionality that is exposed with the facade that the details effectively help implement. Right. right. Um, and so the idea is this gives us what we call good high cohesion and low coupling. And that's the thing we want, right? So co cohesion is the property that everything inside a module tends to have a similar purpose. And we, we often, quite often say, tends to need to change together for the same set of reasons. Okay. Um, and uh, coupling is the property that one, a change to one module results in a change to another module. What we really want is low coupling. So in other words, a lot of the time when I change my module, I'm changing implementation details. The facade remains remains constant and nobody else has to make any changes to their code, right? So that's low coupling. And it tends to have, come from high cohesion because all those implementations just need to change for that particular feature or part of my code base is contained inside that single module. And generally speaking, what you don't want to do is think about modules in terms necessarily just of the flow of the system, but you want to think about modules more in terms of errors of responsibility because then they have high cohesion. Okay. okay. Well, we can also think about high level modules and low level modules, right? So low level modules don't depend on anything else. And high level modules depend on other things. And we tend to find that um, the more reusable kind of uh, things that are basically um, uh, that are key to our system tend to be things that people tend to want them to have few dependencies. And the things that are at the top tend to be the bits that are kind of gluing it all together. Okay. So generally, when this model, you might think, well, Actually, something like my domain model, I'd like to put down here with having no dependencies. I'd like to basically be, be something that effectively that I can use from the glue bits like controllers, et cetera, in my code. The other interesting thing about modules is if they've just got a facade and some details, in theory, I can replace one module with another one that has exactly the same facade, but a different set of implementation details. That may help us basically um, uh, with uh, making change, right? And sometimes we may find we, we, we want different paths through our code, so I activate a different module. So typical examples are kind of large order paths, small order paths. Um, here for kind of room booking modules, you could have group bookings and you could have individual bookings. It may have a similar facade to the system, but the logic implemented is, is quite different. 
Okay. And the integrated substitution is, is, is pretty similar, right? The other thing, of course, with modules is this classic thing of testing. In theory, effectively, I can swap a module for something that can stand in for it during testing. Um, and that is really how this notion of unit integration and system tests comes about. It's the idea of the unit as a module. Um, uh, effectively, you get rid of its dependencies and essentially you just test it in isolation. But note that a module here is not necessarily it doesn't have to be a class in that classic model. Got it. And so really quickly, we got one question coming in from YouTube. And uh, mm -hmm. this person is saying, uh, can we say that an aggregate, and he has DDD for domain-driven design, mm -hmm. are types of uh, modules? Can we, can we look at them from that perspective? You could, yeah. I mean, aggregate's a good candidate to be to, something that you might want to choose to implement as a module. It has a root, effectively, as a kind of, you know, Thing that you effectively would perform some operations on at the top, and then it has um, a tree underneath where effectively you don't really want to access that so directly. So your repository should tend to bring back an aggregate root. And if you have multiple things in a tree below, you just want to deal with, you want to lock and deal with the root. The only thing would be a little bit is that aggregates uh, are the, the 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 concept behind them is a lot more about locking, right? I can just lock this root object. I don't have to lock everything. And, and the idea is that reduces the number of locks that I have to apply in, say, for example, a relational database system, which that scales better. That's really what a lot of what the kind of aggregate idea is about, as opposed to just an entity coming out of my uh, store. I have an aggregate because I can, if I lock this one route, I lock the whole, whole tree. Got it. When we I think about me, it, also kind of it kind of reminds me of like the solid principles that you know I know I remember before everyone was talking about mm. these solid principles and there's the the D in solid like the event dependency inversion principle where pretty right. much it says like you have to depend on abstractions versus like the concrete implementation of that abstraction. Yeah, we, and we're going to come to dependency inversion again in a little bit. That's going to come up in just a second. So we're going to come and we explain exactly how that relates to the modules. Got it. Um, but what, what are modules in .NET, right? So there is, I mean, I've seen some people like Jubilees that don't argue that, hey, the objects are module in .NET. But actually we do have a first class uh, structure which we can use for modules. Now, interestingly enough, .NET confuses the issue slightly. There is actually a technical module in, in .NET which is just supposed to compile a file which you can kind of link together. But we actually need a slightly, from the computer science concept of a module, what's something a bit, a bit higher level where we can say, hey, I want to hide all these details and expose this facade. And that is really just an assembly, right? You think about an assembly, what an assembly does for you is it says, hey, anything that I declare as public can be seen outside the assembly. Anything that I declare as internal, things inside the assembly can see each other. Right? Anything that's private is hidden from other things, even within the side of the, the assembly. So at a very, simple starting place you take an assembly and say what do i need to expose in this assembly to other assemblies in order to use the functionality it contains that's public what do i need to share as part of, as part of cooperating objects that implement this assembly they're internal and what do those little objects themselves need to hide from other things so they want they want implementation hiding within side those items well those things can be private so, so assemblies are really of this first class citizen in .NET for actually using modules. So one of the best ways to use assemblies is to think about, hey, I've got a set of things that change together because they all share some kind of responsibility or things that I can reason about having a similar role, right? Um, you know what? I can make them an assembly. I could give you the public interface that gets you to the um, parts that I need you to basically interact with to use it, and I can hide all implementation details. And that means if I then want to go and change its implementation details inside that particular assembly, no one effectively using the module has to worry unless I change that public interface. Right. And that gets us to the next concept, which is layers. All right. So one of the problems you could get is let's say you have a module A, right? And let's say you change its facade. And let's say that a module C has implementation details that are taken dependency on A by depending on its facade. Right? That means that if I change that facade on A, as well as rebuilding A to basically um, build that functionality in, I'm going to have to rebuild C because C has a dependency on that changed interface. 
Now, imagine that effectively that change that I made to A that changes the implementation details of C, for some reason that bubbles up and it hits basically the interface of C. So C is now going to change its interface in response to this change. But imagine that B has implementation details that depend on C's interface. Right. Then I've got to basically well build A and C and then B. Right. But if I then was to find that A had implementation details depending on B's interface, I've conformed a complete cycle in that this change to A's implementation details or ripples forces C to rebuild, which changes interface forces B to rebuild, which in turn would force A to rebuild, but that's what I'm trying to rebuild to get my change in the first place. And some dependencies stop you building, right? Um, I, people don't build these, these 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 problems quite so much anymore. But I can remember, I mean, years ago when I was a C plus plus developer, and we used to have the you know bad old world of the daily build, and it would take four hours to run in C plus plus. We would regularly encounter this problem of people have created a psychic dependency that we had to then basically fish out and break. So there's a way to stop you getting psychic dependencies, right? And that is layers. And so one of the key things that layers will do for you is stop you getting psychic dependencies. And that's because a layer says you can only depend in a given direction. So here, this is a classic three layer structure, right? And we'll, we'll talk about the three layer structure because some people basically are down on it. And we'll talk about why they are and why, why maybe that's misunderstanding. But here's a classic three layer structure. I've got a UI layer, right? Some kind of presentation layer. If this was an API, a, a HTTP API, that'd be my HTTP API. So some kind of presentation layer. I've got a domain layer, right? That's where effectively I've got the rules effectively that my business cares about. And then classically below, I've got an infrastructure layer, which is probably talking to the database, but might also be things like talking to say a payment provider. And classically, this idea is that I can de I depend downwards. So the things in my presentation layer a and D, they can depend on the domain layer and B, but B, as you can see by that kind of like stop sign, can't depend upwards on the presentation layer, right? And A can also depend on what's called a relaxed model. It can skip the intervening domain layer and go straight to infrastructure, which is very useful. That's where kind of you start to think about CQRS, well, that one of the things it's doing is skipping the layer in between. Um, strict models don't let you do that. Strict models, you have to pass all the way through the individual layers. We'll talk about why that. That is a bit later. One of the principal ideas behind layers, though, is just breaking that socket dependency chain, right? I can't get socket dependencies now because I don't let you depend upwards, right? Simple rule stops it happening. The other thing that's useful about it, though, is it helps me reason about the responsibilities that those modules have. I've got modules whose responsibility is presentation. I've got modules whose responsibility is the rules, basically my application. And I've got modules which tend to be do, doing some kind of IO with the outside world for that are where I want to get stuff from in response to the request in the presentation layer. And that can actually be helpful. I know where to look for stuff. And I know I can reason about, hey, that these things are appropriate different layers. One of the reasons people are a little bit down on this classic presentation domain infrastructure model, though, is uh, people assume that is all that layering offers you. And really, I can have any layers I wanted, right? As long as basically I have this kind of like downward dependency model, sometimes referred to as the layer cake model, because you know the, 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 the layers stand on each other, right? Then I won't get a socket dependency. I can have whatever layers I want. And in fact, you know, if you look at some like domain-driven design, one of the things it encourages is you to have modules in your domain layer, which represent portions of your domain. Right? Um, so, so don't get fixated on the idea that you have to have these three layers. Just recognize that layering is a way of stopping socket dependencies and modules, and also giving you a way to navigate your modules by saying, hey, things that have this kind of role are all going to live at this kind of layer. So when I think about layers, one of the first things that comes to mind is you know, how I used to build applications a long time ago. There was always like a database layer, and then there's a yeah. business logic layer, you know, whatever, whatever your organization thinks. Yeah. makes sense for layering. And then one of the things that I've seen come up more recently in conversations is the onion architecture, where you know instead of looking at you know vertical layers, we're looking at concentric circles 
of of things right like there's a corollary in the middle and then yeah you know you're like the things that depend on it like now encompass it in the outside um you know in the, in the outside circle so to speak yeah so we're going to come to that because that is a form of clean architecture so onion is class as a form of clean architecture so clean architecture is just a way of saying hey a whole lot of people independently realized that there's a similar model of ports and adapters onion an old one called boundaries controllers entities and they're just a form of layering right so we're definitely okay. about to come to that so the first okay. thing i want to sort of cover off first though is dependency inversion because it's important to understand where that comes from so if i've got this layers model right what happens if in my domain model i want actually to get access to something that basically is a, a type which is basically belongs to say d in the upper layer so imagine for example that there was some useful information on the uh http post and i wanted to create a type to encapsulate that in d um, and i wanted to pass down that kind of information into my domain model but then my domain model if it then uses that type has a dependency on something that belongs to D, right? Uh, potentially an implementation detail as well. And we, and, we, and we say we can't do that. So how can I pass something then down from D as a kind of, you know, into, into B and, and B can take a dependency on that information. That seems problematic, right? So the idea, this is where dependency inversion comes in, right? The dependency inversion just says, B declares at its layer, an interface that says, hey, I need to take a dependency on something that has this behavior, right? So whatever the data is effectively, et cetera, that, that, that D is gonna put into that type, hey, I need to basically express an interface that describes what I can get from that, right? So my, I expose my requirements as an interface, right? I say, I need these things. And then I simply ask D, whoops, give me an implementation of that so d creates a concrete object that implements that interface it can then pass that into me at a really simple level i don't need an iic container to do this i just new up something and pass it to the object below but because it implements that interface right the dependency that b has is that the interface defined at its own level D is allowed to depend on things below it. So it can say, I implement that interface. And A or D, whatever can create a simple a, a, an instance of that D and pass it down. D could do it itself, right? Um, but I can pass an instance of that item down the stack to B. That's all dependency inversion is. And that's what it was originally built for. Is the idea in a layered architecture, you can't create basically this thing that lies above you something has to get passed into you. So you describe an interface, which is the requirements you need. And there's something at the other layer can create a concrete instance of it and pass it in. And you just get the interface. You don't really care what the concrete type is that's implementing it. And you just call the methods that you need the requirements of. Okay. You know, one of the things that has come up with me and questions that folks have asked me in the past mm. is where do those interfaces live? Like, where do I define the interfaces? Um, right. And you know, I know some folks believe, well, the interfaces should be defined in the layer that they come from. But then some folks I know are like, well, the in interface should be in some interfaces assembly, like something that is not within right. the lower layer and then implement yeah. there as well. And so now I know there's a little bit of a conversation that's always happening regarding, well, should I have a whole project just for interfaces and then implement them yeah. in concrete assemblies or whatever the case is? So I don't know if you have any Opinions yeah, so I would say define the interface with the module that essentially says, hey, I need to get one of these, right? And if that interface, if you have a number of those, where in a sense it's shared, right? A number of modules at that layer all need some service from above and you want to share a common interface amongst them. Yeah, it's okay to define basically a assembly at that layer that says, hey, these interfaces, this layer tends to use from above. Um, sometimes that's a little bit of a smell. I, I, I find that basically multiple things in that layer are yeah. too commonly using things from above. It's kind of like, why do they all need that? Is there, is there, a, are they genuinely separate modules? Um, 
but yeah, I would I would start with the module that needs it defines the interface at that layer. If multiple things do need it, you could consider sharing them across the modules at that layer. Um, Got it. Okay. But yeah, um, interfaces are belong to the consumer. They're the, they're the consumer's abstraction of saying, give me something that satisfies the contract that I'm going to describe to you. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, let's talk about domain models a bit. Right. So inside that kind of domain uh, layer, there tend to be two types of business logic we, th we think about. One basically says, hey, this thing is solely focused on uh, a thing we need to do in the domain, generally some kind of rule. Often, one of the things to think about here is I have a rule that requires some facts, so some state, um, uh, and uh, it operates on those facts, and it gives us some kind of result when we exercise that rule against those facts, right? And that's our classic, uh, hey, I've got an object, it's got some state and it has some methods on it because those methods basically work on the encapsulated state, right? Um, you know, great that nowadays we can, and I hope you would all consider that, basically hide this implementation data, some of those classes of things like yeah, cool nowadays, you don't have to expose it all as public properties leaking your implementation details out, right? The other is some kind of application logic, which tends to represent some kind of workflow, so, right? So I've got this entity that says, oh, I've got some states some facts, and I've got some rules that basically work with those facts. But actually what I need to do to get anything, something useful done, I actually need to check two or three rules, uh, you know, and that effectively bits of logic and apply them together. And that will basically represent something useful that the user wants to do, right? And that logic, we, we tend to think of as application workflow logic. It, it doesn't necessarily always, um, work against state and rules of state it just coordinates the activity of those things so if i have a number of classes in the above group which represent we think of as entities that's basically state and the behavior that's coupled to that state then i might have a class that says hey i know how to orchestrate a number of those entities to get you functionality and typically if we look at a layer diagram we often think of a split happening like this we have in the domain layer a service layer and an entity layer. Well, a service set modules. Are, I mean, whether it's a layer or not is a bit of a tricky question, but I mean, people sometimes think of it as a split layer with a service layer and an entity layer. And you have a modules for the service, and you have modules for the entities. And the service is how you basically call and use the entities. Entities, of course, don't talk back to the service, right? So the entity layer, I've got these classes that effectively have state and behavior set of state. And above it, a service layer where I do some orchestration and kind of workflow logic. And once upon a time, it was not uncommon in .NET land to represent these as, say, a class in B that was all static, all static methods on it that essentially orchestrated your actual objects that had both state and behavior. Yeah, I've seen some different implementations of that. I've seen, I've seen, like you said, like different projects. I've also seen different solution folders with multiple projects representing yeah. like those different layers as well yeah okay so there are a couple of different sort of implementation techniques one is the logical lives in my entities and i have a very thin layer basically effectively just coordinates those items right and generally basically um the idea is your facade over those in the service layer should do the minimum. It just coordinates the entities. All the real behavior of your domain model should live with inside those entities. And that's what probably you and I classically think of as a domain model, right? Um, the other one basically is what's called an operation script. And that's where you say, well, actually, I don't really have many rules associated with the state. It's really, I store some state, I get some state back out. It's a very, very CRUD based application. And there, in some cases, it may actually be better to have your service have the logic of, you know, saying, hey, you know what, I've just got a, some sort of uh, data structure which basically has some public fields inside it. I get and I, I, I save those, I get them out, right? And I've got it in the service layer, I've got the script that does most of that work. So it's a question of whether you want a thin facade and a rich domain layer because you have a rich domain model or effectively just some objects that effectively are very thin representing state and a richer application workflow because 
really your application is much more about application work for some crud based stuff. Neither one of those is right or wrong. It just depends on what you're actually dealing with um, in terms of your application, right? Um, and it's actually, you know, though some people don't are not, are not fans of it, it's actually okay within a well-structured application that has good modular structure to say, hey, over here, I've got basically kind of operation strip style module. It's dealing with some data structures, you know, that basically are very, the, the state and no behavior. And over here, I've got a module that's actually a rich um, domain model with a thin facade dealing with proper entities. And that's actually okay uh, within some application, provided you clearly have those in separate modules. So you're not mixing the two types together, which is confusing. Let's talk about ports and adapters. So ports and adapters is probably one of the most famous to clean architecture styles, right? And all we'll show you a couple of uh, ports and in BCE. So the reason for showing all that stuff beforehand is just to help you understand that really the, the, everything you, you need to know, you already know now. We're talking about modules and layers. Okay. Um, so, it's a, so basically what it has is these layers. It has an application layer, which is for you and I, the domain layer. Um, nothing has caused probably more confusion than the fact that Alistair Coburn decided to call the domain layer the application layer. Um, because he talks about basically ports of the application, I and mean, you and I might think the application actually is the running software, right? Uh, he doesn't mean that, he means the domain layer, but nothing has caused more confusion than that. Um, the adapters, which essentially do IO in and out basically of our, our overall system, and ports, which are essentially what sits between the adapters and the domain model. Now, this is a kind of uh, diagram representation. The reason for it's called the model portion system, often called hexagonal architecture, is because the typical diagram representation is a hexagon. Why? Well, because Alistair wanted you to think in terms of these flat faces as things getting exposed. So in the middle, I, those circles represent entities that represent classes that got state and behavior. The kind of hexagon that surrounds them are the ports. It represents effectively a point of uh, a facade over the domain. So think about the basically we're just talking about basically some kind of service level being a facade over our domain model, right? And it's a it's a facade over the domain where effectively we do application workflow, right? Ring a bell. Um, and the adapters then effectively call the ports to exercise the system behaviors. And the adapters are stuff like if you look over here on the left-hand side, we've got stuff like HTTP adapter or a GUI adapter. So, you know, it could be, um, you could be thinking about basically an HTTP API. We might be thinking about razor pages, feeds. I could have an atom feed, so it's exposed out. Um, over on the right-hand side, um, the left, by the way, something's called prime and the right secondary. I've got something like a database where effectively I'm reaching out to go and store my data or retrieve data. But there are other ports. For example, if I raise a, an event, I might do so to Azure or RabbitMQ with an MQP adapter, right? Or I might send an email or I might send out something out via Signal R, right? So there are other kinds of IO adapters our application can use, and they all sit around the outside. So if I think about this as a layer diagram from what we saw earlier, right? It's kind of, it has the adapter layer, which fulfills the functions of both the infrastructure and UI layers that we saw before in other models. So all of our IO basically goes in that layer. So we're saying all the modules in there have some kind of IO responsibility, all right? And then a, a, a ports and application layers, right? But the port layer, it's effectively what we talked about before. It's a facade that basically does our kind of workflow. And the layer down below that is the application layer is the kind of entity layer that contains our classes basically in state. Right. And you can yeah. see again, effectively we use the interface model dependency inversion in order to basically take dependencies on things that live outside, right? So if for example, up in my um, port layer, I want to get access to the database, how do I do that? now? In the three layer model we saw before, it was not uncommon for your domain to say, hey, give me some access to the database and I'll go and save myself, right? Here I can't do that because the database layer is not below the domain, it's above. So I need to pass in 
through my port into my port something that says, well, here's access to the database. And typically, this is where ideas like the repository or a DIO interface come from. Because what I'm saying is, hey, at my port layer, what I need is something that I can use to get data out of a data store, right? Because in my workflow, I'm going to start that by getting something out of the data store, exercising it, which will be basically an entity that from my application layer. That's, believe me, I can depend on it. Exercise it somehow, exercise more than one of them somehow, and maybe save the state at the end of it, right? And to do that, I'm going to need some way of getting hold of that data. Well, okay, I'll define an interface like IDAO or a repository or entity gateway, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, folks get fussed about people, you know, saying, "Hey, well, look at the repository pattern again." People, like, right? Just you can call it entity gateway, right? And no one has to have to fight you over what over what, what you've used for it. Um, but just an interface that lets you have put the actual concrete implementation in that layer above. Why is it valuable? Well, our domain layer is clean completely of any technology concerns, right? Remember we talked about earlier on about the idea that these low-level modules had no dependencies, right? Well, with these, our domain layer then has no dependencies. So it's not subject to change around technology concerns. Um, and that's where we can therefore mean that our business investment's pretty secure because it's if we decide we're going to change the way we represent that, we want to use a different, uh, you know, um, we want to switch to a different web framework. That's fine. Our domain model doesn't really care that we've done that. We want to switch to a different database. The main model doesn't care that we've done that, right? It's weird. I know this is a European American thing. I mean, I, I, I quite often end up in projects switching databases over the lifetime of an application. Everyone in America talks on Twitter never, never does it. I don't know whether there's a whole <laughs> European American thing going on here. Um, uh, whether you just all rewrite stuff because you've got more money, who knows? Uh, <laughs> I always hear but, that all the time too. I always hear, why do we need an abstraction? We never change the database. And I've been on tons of projects where the database changes. So I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't get it. I don't know where that yeah. comes from. The other thing actually that changes as much the database though is the technology you use to access the database. So you decide to throw away, you know, and hibernate and take in Dapper or whatever, right? So mm -hmm. those change quite a lot. And that's the same thing because you're, that adapt that lives at the adapter layer. Um, yeah. So it, it gives you that ability to change the frameworks you're using to do some of that work as well quite easily. And that's that can is often more of a pressure on us as devs to go, hey, this new hotness is far better than the old thing you're using. And Lord knows you've been a Microsoft developer long enough. You have seen a lot of ways of getting data out of a database. Yeah, uh, for sure. OK. So interestingly enough, right, uh, Ivy Jakobsen, uh, some of you who are, have gray in your beards uh, may know who Ivy Jakobsen is. Some of the youngsters may not. So Ivy Jakobsen basically is famous for writing, lot, doing lots of the pioneering work about object orientation, and particularly came with an idea called a use case. A use case, for those of you who have not seen it before, is a kind of a heavyweight version of a user story. Um, this is what a use case might look like for ordering basically food in a restaurant. So if you look over on the left-hand side, I come in as a client. And there's a use case called basically order food up the top, right? So I place my order, I order the food in that use case. The waiter takes that order and he uh, he may also let us order wine, right? Because, you know, we like to have wine. Uh, and then basically the waiter will then effectively send the order through to the chef who cooks the food and the use case. When, it's, when, the, when the food is cooked, the waiter can then serve the food and the wine. There, there are more use cases. And then I will then eat the food and drink the wine and pay for the food and pay the wine. All these use cases represent effectively things that somebody involved in this process wants to do, a kind of little mini workflow, if you like. Right. Yeah. I remember creating a lot of these back when back when I was still in college. And I was like, wow, like this must be what real folks do in, in enterprise. Yeah. And then I started working and no one ever <laughs> used one of these. But for yeah. me, like, I, I would create them from my personal understanding. Because for me, it, it makes it very clear about the direction which information is flowing and like what the expectations are. Yeah, one of the interesting things is that um, if you look at some of the more sophisticated techniques for doing user stories, like story mapping, things like that, et cetera, they, uh, they lean quite heavily on the kind of history of use cases. And indeed, Alistair Coburn, who was a big fan of use cases, um, uh, wrote a book, I think, Agile, Agile Use Cases, which effectively blur the line between uh, use cases and user stories. So it's, it, it's almost like you can think of uh, use cases as kind of the, the grand uh, parent of 
user stories that come a bit later. Uh, and some of the more uh, useful techniques around user stories lean on some of the learnings we had from use cases, but they're over detailed probably. Although the average Jira ticket looks worse than a use case. Um, okay, so he got, he wanted to express this idea of the use cases clearly in his architecture. So he came up with this idea called boundary controller and entity. And he said, hey, when I think about basically my system, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a boundary. And the boundary is gonna be an object that interfaces with basically actors. So things outside my system, like users or databases or payment gateways, right? Some of this stuff which should be starting, it's starting to sound familiar. And hey, there's gonna be entities and they're gonna be state and the rules that depend upon that state. Okay, we've talked about that before for sure. And the controllers that later change, then we change to interactors because controllers is like service or event is one of those words that we can't find enough things to attach meaning to for in software development for some reason. Um, but they mediate between boundaries and entities. So the idea was that a boundary would never talk to an entity director, it would talk to an interactor and the interactor would effectively be a, the kind of execution of a command that the boundary had created, right? And so for Jakobsen, this is where the use case is expressed in the interactors, where the workflow happens, right? Some of you may begin to see the pattern we're talking about now. So my actor talks to a boundary object, which talks to the control object, which basically exercises the entities, right? So if I begin to think about this diagram we drew early, it becomes pretty clear that that model is the same, right? The boundary is our adapter layer. It's the IO concern layer. The control object is that port layer. It's the domain workflow layer. And the entity object basically is the application layer. It's where the entities live in my application. So the point about clean architecture is there has been, if you like, consistent re-implementation quite independently, we think, of this idea. Um, and onion architecture is another one. And it, it appears that people just, people just keep coming back to the same principle of where working because it keeps the domain really clean of any kind of technology concerns. Um, the interesting thing is, but basically Jakobsen saying controllers are in terms of objects that implement use cases, right? So they're saying, hey, what you should do in encapsulate in that interaction as a use case, this like little workflow, you could name it after the use case. You could have a cook food interactor, right? If I think about modules, we're thinking about modules as being things that effectively let us reason about the system and encapsulated things that basically had a cohesive kind of role in the system. Hey, and actually that would make some sense we think about those modules around use cases, right? Because, hey, that's a cohesive kind of thing. It's subject to the same forces of change. Whenever I want to change how we cook food, maybe cook it, I mean, that's the thing I could target, right? And a port in ports and adapters is exactly the same thing for Coburn. It's a use case boundary. Remember, Aster Coburn also wrote some stuff about use cases later. And he was saying, hey, one of the reasons things I want to do is expose uh, basically use cases clearly in the architecture. So both of them had this same idea that the use case, which you can think of maybe as the user story, right, is, is exposed somewhere in my architecture. And it's at this layer. And this model is effectively the same. And so what that tends to basically also help out with, I find, is testing. So I don't want to do much about testing because I do lots of other talks and testing, but one of the things to bear in mind is that you can actually think about driving your tests against that port layer because that use case is a useful um, piece of uh, behavior that you want to get under test. And then you treat your your tests basically as another adapter that is driving your domain through the mechanism of the port. Now you can uh, do what we call basically shifting gears and shift the gear in your testing practice to actually address the entities directly if you need to, but it's often quite useful to think a little bit more about actually testing against that port layer. Okay. And then really, when we talk about more about, say, integration tests, we're really focused on that in this model, more on that adapter layer, testing that adapter layer works, right? With some system tests on the outside. And nowadays, I'm pretty sure that you can, for example, with the average kind of open API style HTTP API with JSON, I'm pretty sure there's a good model for bash scripts and JQ being perfectly adequate system tests, but I'll get shot <laughs> for that. Uh, okay. 
Um, honestly, I keep thinking I could just write lots of things in, in JQ and Bash scripts. Okay, uh, or PowerShell, uh, depending on your preference. So this is actually what the clean architecture looks like. This is the kind of canonical picture of it, right? I've got entities at the center. I've got use cases surrounding them. Around that, I've got my kind of controllers, gateways, and presenters around that. I've got the actual um, physical things that provide the services to me, right? So the blue layer represents things like um, uh, a database, you know, network interface adapters, etc. The green layer tends to not be stuff you you write. It tends to represent things like SP.NET Core, Entity Framework, right? Stuff that you're using. The use case layer is really where you want to write stuff. So you just write a controller. Um, to, to plug into effectively SP.NET Core, but the, the, you put most of what you're actually, your, your logic into your use case, and that drives your entities, right? So you have this kind of model of skinny controllers with a fat kind of use case model and the fat entities inside it with all the behavior. And you and you don't put all of your logic then into your controller. Same way, effectively, you know, your, your gateway to the database through entity framework core and your DB context, right? Actually, you just, you wrap that up and you just use that from within your use case. And we'll show some a little bit of code towards the end. Should give you a clearer picture of that. Um, so the model is depends inwards, right? Remember, the, with our layers, basically to avoid socket dependencies, we're always going to have a dependency in one direction. So you depend inwards, right? And if you want something from above, you use dependency inversion. So if I want to get a hold, basically, of something that, uh, of uh, say uh, entity framework calls DB constantly to wrap that, right? And you'll see actually the code I've got tonight um, has got mistaken. I'm trying to fix that up, although. Uh, I was saying to Cecil earlier, I managed to break my demo code version, so I'm not running an older one, trying to fix that up for you. But I, I'll, I'll explain to you what the problem is, and then we, in a couple of weeks' time, I'll let you all know when I've got the fix in for the demo code for this actual talk. Yeah. Um, so, so Ian, really quickly, one thing I've noticed that a lot of folks in the chat are talking about is mm. DDD, right? Like domain-driven design. Mm. And so, I mean, we're not going to dive into too deep into what domain-driven design is in this particular mm. stream, but I'm curious, is domain driven design something you think that is required or just something that would be helpful when implementing a clean architecture? I think it's the other way around. I think if I want to implement domain driven design, one of the things that helps that, that I will find useful is to have a domain model that is cleanly separated from the technology. Okay. And uh, a clean architecture helps me do that. What lives in my kind of entity layer? And a little bit in my interactor layer is the stuff DDD cares about, right? Whereas everything else, it doesn't want to really understand, so it moves them away. So in a sense, the repository pattern, you know, what is it? What was it originally for in in DDD? The idea, effectively, is that my domain code doesn't want to really know about database interactions. So here is this abstraction of a collection, or an abstraction mm -hmm. of querying the collection in some way. Um, and it's going to hide away from you for the fact that that collection is not necessarily a lovely memory thing that you've got nearby, but it in fact requires you to talk to a database and get stuff out. That's what that's what all that really meant. Right. And I find the clean architecture is a very good way of giving you that domain model that's free of all those concerns, um, and gives you just really this narrow interactor layer that says, "Hey, I'll, I'll do the business for you of." taking in a request from outside, maybe talking to the gateway, marshalling all the entity pieces and making sure they work and making it happen, right? There's a little bit of this application workflow logic that has to happen. But yeah, you can focus on your domain model. It helps with testing too. Um, but really, it's an enabler, this model of those kind of domain-focused practices. I would see TDD and DD as really being domain-focused practices, right? And in, okay. and in fact, um, really, so what was, what was Eric's war cry with domain-driven design? Eric's concern was that um, uh, the really smart developers in your organization are spending all their time dealing with tech stuff, not with the domain model that, can, that, that basically is your, your business. And that's mm -hmm. actually where the value lies, right? And that we've, we've somehow shifted the focus of our attention and everything else to, hey, um, what database ORM am I using and how slick is it, et cetera? What library Not, and what is the UI? Yeah, no, that's Yeah. Stuff. Well, but the domain is really the heart of it. And so what Eric's book is really was about more than anything was um, re getting 
developers to understand the main models, how to re-engage with them, etc. And indeed, actually, you know, adventure design is a funny book in the sense that it's, it's strategically about making your, surfacing your domain. Per se, it doesn't go into a lot of details beyond ubiquitous language, all those kind of things, etc. On good domain modeling, and you need to look also at things like responsibility-driven design from Rebecca Wells Brock, et cetera, to really grok that whole picture because he was building on that. As, assuming at that point you probably read that book anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think clean architecture is an enabling strategy to make that easy for, for things like DDD and TDD. It makes them really easy. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So here is kind of a laid out flat model rather than a concentric rings model. And you can see the idea here is I've got some kind of delivery mechanism. So let's say, for example, I get an HTTP request. So I've got some kind of web server, a boundary layer, which is where I uh, interface with that. So I'm writing my controller in, say, SP.NET Core. Um, it isn't allowed to touch entities. It has to go through an interactor. So it's going to receive in a request model. So you might think of that as a DTO, right? Some kind of data structure that represents, say, the body of a post request or something. It's going to deal with an interactor. So it's going to go to basically this layer in between and say, hey, can you run that use case for me? Can you run that use case to basically order food? The interactor is going to go away and say, okay, I need to actually go and get some the menu out of the system. So I'm going to go to the entity gateway and load that up for you. And that's going to be one of my entities, right? And then I get some other entities. I may just new up myself, et cetera. And then I'll, I'll do the work. And then I, I've done the work. I'll give you a response back. And again, I don't want to give you the response in the, in the shape of an entity because that's something that you can't touch. It's in a different layer. So I give you back some kind of data structure, which, which you can then represent, right? And that's actually quite useful when you have these at the interface layer when you have facades that um, deal with primitives and don't deal with basically types that are basically part of your implementation details, be very wary sometimes people expose implementation details out of their facade by putting them on the facade itself. Right? So the way we think about that is this, right? So web control, API framework, question response model, right? Now, people talk about MVC sometimes, they go, is that MVC? MVC lives down over here, right? Web controller effectively, yeah, and its response model all deal with that MVC thing. That's nothing to do with this basically interactor and entity, right? Different, similar models, they're similar shapes, right? And the idea effectively of separating, say, a model and presentation, effective, et cetera, but they are, des they are designed to fulfill separate, separate goals. Um, and down here, we're just showing basically the entity gateways talking potential on some database, okay? So I'll, 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 only, I'll move through these slides a bit quickly. But how do I implement that interactor layer is one question that then comes up, right? Because that's because this gets us into the other parts, which is brighter. So one way of implementing a use case in an interactor layer is to think about the command pattern, right? So what's the command pattern? Basically, it's an interface that has a method on it called execute. You call it, you basically call its constructor. You pass any parameter state from the outside in the constructor. You call its execute and it runs the domain, the entity layers. So the command pattern, it turns out, is a really good model for being that kind of interactor layer. And people often, in the original pattern, talk a lot about the command pattern being a kind of transactional scope, right? Hey, I'm gonna do some work, and at the end of that work, there'll be a result. So command patterns are really to where doing that. Um, and you can see that model here saying, okay, I've got some kind of I command, um, of an uh, interface so generally speaking you, you you can effectively create concrete instances of a, a command but i command has an execute on it right and my boundary there just exercises that across the entity right i've got a concrete type of exercise right. very simple now so both got a couple of questions like if you could go back to that previous slide like it looks like yeah. we had a couple of questions about where things are supposed to be so this first one is um from youtube so are entities just the data structure without logic? Was the first one. No, the entity is a data structure and the logic. So the split is entity to contains domain logic. It contains state, of, in other words, of facts that basically make rules that we have about our domain uh, operate on. So I've got some entity. So effectively, I might have something. The classic example I always use is in an entity might be something like um, an insurance policy. And the facts are things like you're a smoker, you're overweight, um, and you go skydiving at weekends for kicks, right? And the rules are how much money am I going to charge you for your life insurance? 
that would live in an entity. It's state plus rules that operate on them. The workflow is that, and you probably wouldn't actually do this workflow in routing insurance, but just for an example, the workflow is, hey, somebody gets in this uh, policy to begin with, and the first thing they do want to do is validate it. They want to validate all the fields are there, that kind of et cetera. And the second thing they may want to do is um, uh, figure out what the possible premiums are for coverage. So they run some algorithm that tells them, et cetera. So those things are potentially different commands that you could exercise. One would be basically validate the submission. One would be basically effectively underwrite the policy, et cetera, right? And the other one would be basically effectively, the, you know, when the customer chooses, it would be we, we, we select the policy whatever, option. Those things would be commands. So they're doing application workflow logic against the entities. Does that make more sense? Got it. And then last one I'm going to ask you before we move on. Uh, also mm. coming in from YouTube. So are view models a part of the presenter or the interactor? Right. Back to that. We got it. Spider the slide. So, the uh, boundary layer. So, basically, those uh, from Port Stats model, the adapters layer, right? Can t is, the, is basically this web con this boundary layer is the web controller. And the view model is essentially the response model. We Remember, we said basically, when I go to the when I come in, so the parameters to my web controller, effectively, et cetera, the objects I use there, but to my request model, I then call the interactor. I may pass them in to basically be the parameter values that get set on that command or whatever. When it's finished and does its work, it gives me back, it, it updates basically a response model, which is effectively your, can be your view model from MVC. That makes sense. Yeah. And then, Last one. <laughs> Last yeah, one go for it. Really. Um, should we use rich or anemic entities? Right. Depends on your on your model. Use whatever you're appropriate to a domain model. So rich model says, hey, I've got some rules and I have state which drives those rules. Right. That's so I, I often tend to think about rich domain models is if you've ever seen rules engines and how they work, that's what a rich domain model should be like, right? I write a rule and that rule depends on some variables, which are basically state. And so what you do with classic rules engines is I load the facts. In other words, um, I load state into the rules engine to represent the value of those variables then I run the rules and it spits out a value. And rich domain models are very similar, right? In a sense that it says, in this object, I encapsulate some rules and I encapsulate some state that effectively is the variables that go into this, the decision moments in that rule, right? So something that something that prices something effectively, etc., would have you know prices, discounts, that kind of etc., right? As facts, and then essentially the rule says, oh, what you do is you add up all the items, you see what the discounts apply, you give loyalty bonuses, etc., effectively, and you have the price at the end of it, right? But if what I'm doing is just saying, hey, I want to store the birthday of every employee. That's an anemic domain model, right? There's no real rules you're applying to. You're just storing the information so you can get it in and out. And the application workflow logic just says, hey, you, what you want to do is get everyone's birthdays out. Great. There you go. So it, it is literally, do you have a domain model? Any rules that apply to state? And you pick the appropriate one. And then, um, so, and this one just came in as well. Yeah, so sure whether to use rich or anemic entities also depends on the programming paradigm. Uh, whether it's object oriented or functional, and that's a question. Would you, would you um, agree with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, to some extent, there is this. Basically, uh, if I have a paradigm that's not OO, I, I'm I, I'm not necessarily encapsulating my state in the same way, for sure. Um, the, uh, the the functional version of this is looks pretty similar in a sense, though, that your your interactor really is much more your kind of uh, functions, basically, effectively, of really your kind of railway syntax down there. But yeah, that's a bit more complex. Um, someone like Scott uh, Valashian is basically probably the person to go and look at his stuff because he, I think, gets this model as well. I think he talks about it somewhere. Got it. Right. Okay. Okay. So I've got a command object. So the other way of doing commands. Which is the kind of pattern you'll see in Mediator and Brighter and libraries like that and says, well, I could I could separate the parameters from the command from the thing that executes some code using those parameters. Why might I why do I want to do that when I separate the two things? Because I can insert effectively middleware and arbitrary things in between 
the point effectively where you ask where you send the command and the point where you receive it and those middleware things are quite often orthogonal concerns like logging um uh bright uc uses it to run poly for example so that you can have policies around retries and stuff like that basically associated with it um uh, there is also a level which basically you, you don't have to know as the sender what is the handler that basically receives this and you can in theory have more than one handler receive it right say so, yeah, actually it's a it's a fan out it's a broadcast or in theory you could say well actually at some point i can swap that over for something else um and the controller code never needs to know that's what dispatch is for and we'll see that um i see how bright does that a little bit later she's in code does that but the idea is that very similar um, i think we're showing the test here all right yeah uh we're showing a test driving it here in this case so basically you've got an actually framework a test again request model basically a setup of the test right and i call effectively directly into my um uh, request handler which basically has an interface usually in a concrete implementation which drives my entities and effectively returns a response model in other words the things i'd assert on the test right so that's just showing you a little bit two things already i should write, really should probably shouldn't show you two things at once but it's showing you basically how that varies around a handler it's also showing you how you can use tests to drive the same model right let me show you some Ooh, uh, code time and as i say um so this this 12 factor tutorial is on my um uh GitHub repo, along with everything else. But actually, the one you're going to want in a long term is CA tutorial, which takes you through it a bit. It has a so the way that the, both of these work is when you go and get to the repo, you'll find the repo's master branch looks decidedly empty, and you'll be like, Ian's, Ian's ripped me off, man. There's nothing here. So the branch represents steps through basically the transition. Um, this one has a number of branches. Um, so there's basically app only and app and worker. We're, we're probably going to show you only app and worker tonight. But the key one, the, the CA tutorial takes you through um, breaking down an app that effectively has no use of layering um, to one that has layering to different strategies that start with a very simple kind of like service layer to then go to commands, then to dispatch and what. So you can see the different variations. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and when you pick it up, I'll probably improve the readme to explain how to use it. Okay. And, and so uh, before you move forward too much, so yeah. could you bump up the font size? It's oh, absolutely really right. small. Um, so what I'd may happen is if I switch this over to presentation mode, it doesn't, it's doing nothing. Why are you doing nothing? Ryder, you've let me down in front of all these people. <laughs> uh, That's better. That, is, that is a lot better, isn't it? Yeah. That's much now, better, yeah. I have to remember to do basically is bring back the tool window on that side. Okay. So I can now yeah, that looks perfect. Um, okay. So this is running actually in the background. I'm running some Docker with basically uh, my SQL in it. It's the world's most over engineered um, hello world application. So the idea is basically I can. Uh, so this is basically Rider has the same thing that code has if you use rest client inside it which is you can create a file with some simple http statements kind of inside it like curl and you can actually just execute them interactively so it's great for writing those kind of like end-to-end -end level tests that go with your app but rest client in in code does the same thing um and here what we can see is i can see have i got any greetings now i think i've got one i prepared earlier which will pop up in a second you'll see the window switch hopefully right we just change the layout slightly so you can see that so it's going to give me a response back it's going to say to me oh 200 okay oh yeah i've got a you already put one in hello mary right so i can add another one i can add hello world so i just post a greeting in come back why not come back uh, okay I've got one, two, hello world seems to have gone in i don't know quite why it decided to there we go hello world and i can then do a get i should have a few in there now right i'm stacking up greetings um obviously it's completely useless and i'm not going to make my fortune from it but it's a fairly simple kind of app which doesn't do too much now because of that there isn't actually a rich domain model here um but it's, it's what it's going to give you is an idea of how we might structure things so if we go into in the greetings app 
right so greetings app has some adapters inside it which basically just me identifying for myself basically what kind of layer that is um, and it has a greetings controller i'm not sure you all know how controllers work but what you can see in here is we've got a couple of things going on right this query processor seems to be doing some things for us and we seem to have this command processor doing some things for us so we'll break that down and i'll explain to you what these two are we'll start with the command processor which is brighter and then we'll go to the query processor which is called darker you know uh, naming obviously you know i i, I really <laughs> envious of hot chocolate as a name i'm like why can't i come with better names like that okay <laughs> right now um okay so the, what the command processor does is just that dispatcher model we saw earlier so here are our parameters. We're saying, I want to add a new greeting, right? It's gonna have a message. So this effectively coming in here is my request object. I'm gonna turn that into basically parameters into my add greeting command. Then I'm gonna say to the command processor, um, send this to someone to deal with. So with the way Brighter works, we have two things, send and publish. Send says one person gets it. Publish says, hey, fan this out. A lot of people want this. And you'll see it as a query after us to go and get some states. So we'll come back to that in a second. So what happens when I do this? Well, Brighter will search for a registered handler for this. Now, uh, we'll talk about registration a bit later. But what happens is in this model over here in my ports kind of layer, um, what I've got are a set of handlers. And so add greeting command will go to this add greeting command handler. Now, the key bit you care about for the minute is you have to kind of basically write this, right? which is you have to you have to implement the handle method. And the handler says, here's a command, right? And because it's async, here's a cancellation token. And in there, what we're just doing is we're saying, okay, we'll get a hold of a entity framework context, um, stick that in a repository, uh, and then we're gonna add basically effectively uh, our greeting into database. And the thing that I'm fixing that is wrong here is really this should be a unit of work because it means we've, we've got a dependency in here on the layer above us, which basically is the entity framework uh, DB context. So what you'll see when I get the CA tutorial version up is we'll replace that something called unit of work um, because we we just want to we just want the behave to express the behaviors that we're getting out of context, right? Um, so that's the greeting context going to implement that for us. Okay, uh, you'll see a command process of post here. We'll come back to that later. The other thing that's more interesting, perhaps, is these attributes that we put on it. What are they for? So remember we said we can have middleware in a dispatcher between the point you send and the point where you actually do your work, like the data, the data sync in your pipeline. So what we're doing here is declaring some of the things we want to happen first. So the steps represent the sequence in which they will happen. It's a Russian doll model. So in other words, each one encapsulates the next. So this one here is the one that occurs immediately before your handler. And what happens is we're saying we're going to use a policy and the policy is retry policy async. And what that means is we provide use policy async as a, you can write these yourself, these basically middleware components and attributes to go with them. We provide a few at the box for you. And one of them is basically to use poly. So this is saying, go and look up at this, the poly policy with this identifier and wrap handle async in that poly policy. So in other words, if this fails, we will retry according to this policy. That's then wrapped in another poly policy, which is a circuit breaker. So in other words, we say if the retries fail, we may choose if we get and see enough failures to break the circuit to this particular handler, which means that when anything gets sent in future, it would just basically get a broken circuit exception back out. And then effectively on the outside, we have a logger, which basically says, they log our attempts to basically run this pipeline. So as you can so see, I, that's I guess it's almost like this is pretty much middleware. Like if we if we compare yeah. it to, yeah, um, you know, like that Russian doll, you know, request in response out type model. Like this is pretty much you doing it, but within the context of brighter. Yeah, exactly. It's just the same thing. It's just middleware. Yeah. Um, okay, and uh, again, we'll come back to post a little bit later. So the other thing we had, when we look back at the controller, is we said, hey, here we're going to do a query press, which said was dark. So what we're doing here, I mean, it's pretty obvious. We're saying, hey, go and get back basically the greeting that we just wrote into the data store, right? Um, 
The thing is, what our, our command is not doing is giving you return value. So we don't give return values from commands. There, there's a trick, which basically is, if, if you want to do that to work around that problem, uh, you can just put basically on add greeting command, you put the out parameters because you can then update them in your handler and then read them here. But it, that's really if you do things like generate identity-based IDs in a database, you need to get them back to retrieve the item. Um, here, because we're just using a GUID, and to do that, we can basically just go and effectively um, uh, pull the item straight back out with the ID that we, we gave when we generated it in the first place. And this basically is using Docker, which is kind of the flip side. It's the thing doing queries rather than commands. So again, it just basically says, hey, go over, find basically the relevant handler for this and execute that. So we're doing greeting by ID, which is over here. And again, you just write basically this bit. So you're saying, OK, I'm going to go and uh, read stuff out. And again, it's got some middleware. Um, two different groups of people slightly have written bits of brighter and darker over time. So you might find that the names are a little bit different. Um, and at some point, we've, we, we have a kind of backlog item to try and sync up some of the provider middleware names. They use retriable query for running a poly policy, whereas we, we, we actually we use use policy. Uh, at some point, we will sync that all up. Um, but it's the same idea, right? You've got middleware like query logging, retrieval query that you're basically using to go and effectively run um, this query. Okay. Now, the other, and, the other thing and I like that you said that. So the question for me now would be, is brighter middleware and darker middleware compatible? Like, can I share them between the two? Or would I have to write different ones for them? I think at the minute they are close but not the same. Okay. So, um, yeah, one of the things I think for us to do is to basically uh, make that much more compatible. Okay. And then uh, we also have some folks in the chat talking about Mediator. Um, right. Could you could you give us like a two-second comparison about like brighter and darker versus Mediator? Sure. So, uh, so we came first. Uh, and uh, when – so I know you meet reasonably well – so Mediator is more lightweight, right? So what Jimmy wanted was something that basically didn't come with any any other dependencies. So we take dependencies on things like Poly and stuff like that, et cetera, and provide a lot of that functionality. Mediator is very lightweight, comes with the first dependencies. So it does less out of the box for you. You have to add more. But if you've just got a very simple use case, Mediator is basically a pretty good option. I sometimes say to people, if you, if you, you know, one thing to do, because they are so similar in, in the way they work, is you can honestly start with Mediator and then say, hey, Brighter's got some interesting functionality. Maybe I'll get, I'll, I'll take in Brighter, and it's not a huge job to then swap Mediator for Brighter. Um, Got it. But they're, they're, they're similar kind of ideas, yeah. And um, we, yeah. Uh, Mediator doesn't have, say, the split that we have between Brighter and Darker as a kind of query uh, model and a, a, a command model. It kind of does all work the box in one thing. I, I think it's, I don't think it's middleware works or anything like the same way else. It's not kind of attribute based. I think it's a later edition. The one thing yeah. we do do that Mediator doesn't do is was given is the kind of the hint of is here, which is a post. Okay. So a post says rather than using an internal bus, if you like, basically to send between a, a sender and receiver, use an external one. Okay. So send this over messaging based middleware. So you can use it to basically do a couple of things. One simple one is to communicate between two microservices over basically messaging middleware. And the other is, which is kind of related, is to say, hey, within my actual service, I've got like a web and a worker because I want to offload. I get a request in. I want to actually just stick it on a queue, chunk my way through that work more, more slowly and just respond back to the user and say, hey, I got your request. I'm working on it, right? Typically a pattern called a task queue. Um, in Python land, they use Celery a lot for that particular model. So if you see Django sites using Celery for that particular piece of work. Right. So we, we tend to use it in, see, used in both of the, those two circumstances, Brighter, um, although increasingly a lot more recently it's been used in a lot more microservices as well. So what you do is you can accept a variety of transports, Rabbit, Kafka, Azure. Azure is out from nine, basically, we've got a decent Azure transport. So nine is currently in beta. Um, AWS, SQS, and SNS. Um, we've got Redis by a basically service stack. Uh, be aware that that service stack is commercial at a certain level of usage. 
we're also probably going to do streams via um uh, uh the um uh, other redis, imp redis implementation which is from the stack overflow team but i can't remember the what they call theirs um okay. uh, uh and we probably get a few more transports out over time i i keep being semi-persuaded i will do nats for basically folks around running in kubernetes right. um I guess we, we we keep looking over at Dapper and, and seeing what 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 transports we may we, we may have to compete on. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, I guess if folks too, if folks if folks that are watching that they want to have a transport that you don't support, like it's open source, right? So people can always contribute their. You own can transport. add transports, yeah, and transports are relatively straightforward to write. That's one of the biggest areas of contribution we get. So one thing we prefer. So why don't, we didn't have an Azure tra a, a transport for ages? Why? Because none of the core team at the time were in an Azure environment. We were either data centers or AWS, but yeah. we but we had people who, who were on Azure environments using it. Um, and the trouble we had was they all ended up with these internal policies kind of saying, no, you can't release the software. We finally managed to get uh, a, a company that said, oh yeah, you can have ours. So we, we got a decent contribution one we know that works at high scale, which is what we wanted to, before we basically released everybody else. Yeah. Um, so that's coming out in nine, basically. Nice. Um, but what I can switch and show you probably is I can show you this command process of post working if I switch over to this. Now, probably what I'll have to do is do a call kind of like, um, let's see, can I get it to scroll up the screen? That's going to be interesting, isn't it? Well, I, I've never understood why that is the pain point of all demos with console applications is that they live at the bottom of your screen. Uh, yeah. And so this is, this is basically just I'm running uh, Docker Compose. I've got a number of Docker containers running the actual app you're just seeing. But if I, uh, what you should see here is you can see actually we've got one already before. You can see there's basically the web and a worker. So the worker effectively is listening to that post request. So over here, this worker, you'll see actually, and the, the, there's not much, doesn't appear much going on. Um, we can talk about brighter configuration. This is an older school version of configuration. Now this is a host builder one. I can show you a quick glimpse of that later on. Does it all? This is long. This is the long version. So under the hood, host builder does does all this for you now. Um, but the key thing to understand here is we're talking to RabbitMQ. We create basically a connection to it, uh, and then we build basically what we call dispatch, which runs basically a message pump that does all the kind of hard work for you. Sorry about that. It looks much simpler now, and I can show you basically how it looks basically with a modern host builder version a bit later. As I say, this is an older example because I crashed the newer one. Um, but the key thing to understand is uh, what we'll do is we will say in a subscriber registry, when we receive this command, run this handler. Now, this actually happens to be over here in the handlers for this, this project. Um, and what is this going to say when I get that handle, I'm going to pump something out to the console, right? So it gets sent by the web app and then this worker app picks it up and just pumps something out just so you can see messaging kind of working. Um, and what will happen is we'll get another message come out like here. So we go over to HTTP. Um, test tests. We run a post that's run one from Alice. I don't think we've seen Alice before. We'll run that. Okay. And then we should see when we go over here, hello Alice now appears basically in the and you can actually see if you look up a bit further, though it looks a little bit kind of like um uh complex. You can see worker here is spitting out something. So this is what's coming from that request logging. Uh, piece of middleware uh, that we added basically is one of the attributes. It's telling you received a message from this queue with this routing key via this exchange on Rabbit, and it tells you basically what that message looked like on the wire. Um, it then basically is also going to tell you some other stuff about building pipelines, etc. Um, you can, you can probably see if I switch over to this. And you ignore my email reminder from Cecil. This is Rabbit. So basically, Rabbit has, let me give you a bit more zoom in a little bit so you can actually see what the hell is going on here. There you go. That's good. Q here. And 
you should be able to see. Let me just send one. You should be able to see, hopefully, uh, the queue kind of reacting. Sometimes we can capture it, and sometimes we don't. We don't see the message right oh, there. You are. So you can see the message kind of going through to so that green line as it waits into the rabbit. All right. Um, just to show you, because I broke my world of demos uh, in Brighter itself, I should better show you what a modern, uh, let's show you this one. And then inside of the solution, like what you're showing us is like that Brighter command repo. Oh, this is a code from the repo. So like if you went to the GitHub repo and you go to samples, everyone will be able to see the code that you're showing right now. Yeah, ex absolutely. So this is kind of uh, how we configure with host builder, which is a little bit simpler, um, which is kind of what we do nowadays in sort of version nine. So effectively uh, a subscription, this is, the, this is the work of the consumer, says, hey, I want to listen basically to this given channel. So that's basically, uh, um, from point of view of rabbit, this is naming and naming a, from Zeus naming a channel. So this is basically the zero subscription. So we're saying, listen to this channel, right? Um, and then effectively, it's saying, um, here's some additional parameters, like when we're going to time out. Um, do you want you to create the infrastructure? So in some cases, we will create the infrastructure on the messaging framework. If you want, if you create, validate says check that the messaging infrastructure exists before you run. And there's a kind of assume that says, hey, I'm just going to go for it. Um, uh, requeue and there's an is async flag. So each one of these sets up an independent, what we call perform, which is a message pump, which reads from a queue. You can have multiple message pumps reading from the same queue. You can effectively uh, increment the number of performers. Uh, but you can see one of ours is async pipeline and one is a, one is a non-async pipeline. Um, when you're writing workers listening to message queues, Sometimes the is async async isn't necessarily as big a performance gain as you might think, because we have a thread reading a message pump that also essentially runs the handler, et cetera. It's a, it's a kind of single threaded performer and you introduce more threads to read from the queue depth predictability, because then you know exactly how many threads are reading the queue and you can effectively predict what your rate of consumption should be. And you can use things like queuing thread to predict what's going on. So we don't tend to basically use like a thread pool and and and, and be uh, explode the number of threads that you're actually using. You get to tell us how many threads you want to use to run worker processes to read a given queue, um, and because of that, effectively you tend to find that if you turn on is async, you're not getting a huge benefit because we're not going away and reading more work while there's currently work in flight because. The problem with that is we have to basically spin off threads to basically pick up that work. Right. Right. Um, okay. And that's the problem. What problem is called? Uh, it's probably more complex than than this particular session. I don't. I hesitate to think that you know we, we have ever scheduled a third session. That's all. But this idea called back pressure, which is basically okay. if I consume a stream, one of the important things for me is to be able to say how fast I want that stream to come at me. Otherwise, I end up drowning. Right. Yeah, um, I'd be I'd be totally down for doing another session in the future about back pressure and some of these other problems. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. for folks that are here that are still here with us, if if that'll be something that you're interested in as well, go ahead and you know just send us a message, give us a thumbs up or something. Because if this is something that you'd be interested in doing, we could always talk about having Ian come back and and discussing that topic with us. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then we basically go and this stuff, a service activator is effectively just saying something that actively listens. Uh, outboxes, uh, we don't have time for outboxes tonight, but an outbox essentially says when you send something, I will store it and I will mark when it's actually been sent on the messaging platform. Some messaging platforms will essentially let you send and then later on, basically via a callback, tell you it's actually sent. And by what it means is copied to all the nodes in the broker. Um, what we'll do is we'll watch for basically that failing and then we'll resend it for you. Um, uh, use external bus just basically says effectively we're, we're, we're building brighter here, but we want to use an external bus for doing posts. So please configure all that stuff for us. Okay. Um, okay. 
Uh, but yeah, yeah, I didn't we, know. We, um, I didn't know you had that feature inside of of Brighter. Like I've seen some no, folks I'm, do it with other other things. Like I've seen yeah. folks do. I'm going to send a thing to RabbitMQ, for instance, and it'll store and push it to another broker, like something in the cloud or whatever the case is. I've seen those types of things happen. I yeah, didn't realize so, you had like outbook functionality in Brighter. We, 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 yeah, it's, it's better from nine. We had it before, but it was difficult to use unless you really knew what you were doing. Um, yeah. We've kind of basically said that's a, that was okay for us, but nobody was using it because we didn't make it clear. So with nine, it's much clearer how to use it. And we also provide some nice in-memory alternatives if you don't want to basically use one that's actually tied to a kind of, kind of persistent store. Um, and it hooks into, so, so Robert MQ, for example, I think will publish a confirms, which basically says, uh, hey, I'll acknowledge when basically you begin sending uh, so you can move on to the next thing. But only when I've actually copied it to all the nodes will I give you the confirmation back. And that's when we basically update the outbox to say it's been it's been actually sent, for example. Um, it. And it's also useful, effectively, if you say, for example, uh, write something to the store, but you effectively then can't send it. And rather than effectively abort that operation, what you want to do is, hey, save that. I've got the message that I want to send saved. Uh, at some point when that store, when the broker comes back up, you'll send it for me, right? So there's a sweeper process you can run in the background, the background service that basically says, keep looking for failed sends from the outbox and resend. Nice. So yeah, gotcha. that, that exists now for us. Cool. So this right. looks like a pretty, pretty cool setup. I know we're running a little late on time. If folks yeah. have any other questions they want to send to Ian, feel free to go ahead and drop them in. Um, and then Ian, do you have any last like any last demos or anything like that that you want to show us? No, nope. I think that's that's cool. I think that's enough for one night. I'd rather answer any final questions people have. Um, I'm I Cooper on Twitter, and my DMs are open. I'm always happy to answer questions about this. If you want to ask stuff around Brighter, we basically recommend. There's a dis we have it on on brighter command brighter on GitHub. Maybe we should show I should show where that URL is. So that would be a good thing to do next. Yeah, that'd Just be cool. And then um, we do have one question so here that's here is, from this is YouTube. a landing page. You go Paramore IO. You can pretty much get to anything from there. If you want to go direct to GitHub, um, the org is brighter command. Uh, and we do have a discussions. So if you've just got questions you want to ask without having to want to raise an issue, you can kind of come in there and we'll basically uh, answer, stuff, answer stuff from there. Nice. Now, one quick question from the audience coming in from YouTube. And um, this was around the CA tutorial that's in your repo. It says, I opened the repo, yeah. but it's hard to know how to get started. Yeah, so it's, a it's a little bit broken because I'm trying to fix it up. Um, what give me a week or so i will fix it up i will put stuff in the readme that explains exactly how to use it and what it's showing you step by step um and i will tweet out about it and i'll make sure tesla knows so he can basically talk about it maybe uh next time and remind you that there's a link up it it, it i i i not like all software developers i estimated it might take me three or four hours to fix it i discovered that the, it was a little bit more work than that so <laughs> probably Generally, my estimates are usually out by a factor of three. So um, probably give me like in about a week or so, I'll probably have it done, but let's call it two. Awesome, awesome. And then, so if folks want to learn a little bit more about Brighter, they can come here to the repo. Um, I sent the links to the different tutorials. So there was the 12 factor tutorial and then the CA tutorial. Yeah. Um, is so there anything so else? Is there any, any other things you want to share with folks before you take off? Yeah. Um, this page is a, is, a, is a useful starting point. We've got some elevator pitch stuff uh, and some some basic stuff here. Uh, we need to uh, when nine is just coming out. It's in beta. Um, uh, nine we won't have updated the docs for yet. So if you want the kind of safer earlier version of Writer, untag the pre-release thing and just pick up eight point whatever it is, which is the, which is the last release we did. If you want all the, the newest features. Um, you may have to come and ask a few questions or look at the examples. We will respond to the questions, but we always, uh, like any open source project, find the docs are a little bit behind. Um, <laughs> sure. uh, the uh, the uh, my, my final note to everybody is, if you want to make friends on an open source project right, and become welcomed amongst the community, the best thing you can do 
is go to project and help write, help write the docs for everything you learn trying to get it working um uh, and you will be you will be loved and hugged <laughs> i i i can completely definitely relate to that for sure well ian it's it's been amazing right we, we've learned hey. tons of stuff um we have lots of folks in the chat saying how interesting this was and how much they've learned from it um and we got a lot of thumbs up for you coming back on and doing something about like um you know back pressure and talking about some other topics so we're gonna yeah, have to I'm talk so about this again at some point yeah, talk about message pump stuff like that. Maybe um, that's something uh, you could pitch you in, in in from from your your experience, my friend. Um, yeah, I think we could definitely we could definitely talk about like some of the things that I've seen from from that perspective as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so for folks, again, thank you all for watching. Definitely appreciate y'all spending your time with us. Um, Ian, thank you as well. And we'll be back again next week. I think we have an F sharp topic on the stream next week. But you know, again, stay tuned. And we'll we'll post that um, to our channel at some point. But until then, I hope everyone has a good weekend, have a good evening, and then we'll see you all again next time. Bye, everybody.